Hello, and welcome to another episode of Other Record Labels. I'm your host, Scott Orr. Today is an incredibly exciting episode because it's something very special. First of all, we're talking with the electronic music label Mute from the UK, who have been around for 40 plus years. Mute Records is home to Depeche Mode, New Order, Moby, Goldfrap, Yazoo, some real incredible names. The history of this label is phenomenal. In fact, I first came to know this label, and I would talk about this a couple of times in this episode, reading this book about electronic music called Mars by 1980, which has mixed reviews, and it was very, very heavy and, and wordy. Um, but it's a good book. It, it, it was worth a read. Regardless, they talk a lot um, about Daniel Miller and Mute Records and Daniel's first project, The Normal. There's a huge history that goes back to 1978 with Daniel starting the label, but before that, releasing a double A side uh, under the band name The Normal, playing shows with other punk bands, and he was doing it with synthesizers in an era, 1978, when synthesizers um, didn't have a great reputation, especially in the punk world. So we're we got this opportunity to talk with Mute. I, I, I emailed them and I got in touch with Amy Spencer who works there today and we do an interview with her. But wait, before we do this interview, Amy was kind enough to help facilitate getting us an interview with the founder of Mute, Daniel Miller. I got a few minutes on the phone with him just a couple of days ago to ask a few questions about what it was like to start an electronic music label, to start playing electronic music all the way back to 1978 when it wasn't as ubiquitous as it is today. It wasn't as loved as some of that music is today or later on. And so this is a really exciting thing to talk with Daniel. And uh, here's a few minutes of my chat with Daniel. And then we chat about what Mute is doing today and some of the legacy of Mute oh, over the past 40 years with Amy Spencer. But right first, here's my interview with Daniel. Um, I uh, I was interested in, and thank you so much for doing this. And I had a great chat with Amy about the, the label and the current state of the label. But at, it was ironic because at the same time that I was, I was chatting with her, I was just finishing up David's book, David Stubbs' book, uh, Mars by 1980. And you were mentioned a couple times in there at the at the beginning with the normal and at the end with Moby, um, but I wanted to ask you um, in David in in David's book um, there was something there was something about how the normal came out of the punk era and uh, but electric electronic music was sort of hated by punks. Why was that? And you were you were attacked on stage by beer bottles. Why was there so much disdain towards your you and, and, and electronic music at that time? Well, I think it comes from two different uh, angles, really. I think when punk started, uh, it was kind of an antidote to progressive music, okay? mm -hmm. progressive rock. Okay, which I was which I also had a, a, a dislike for. So it would be like Yes and, think, and Genesis, is that right? Yeah, that kind of thing. And, sure. you know, yeah, and Rick Wakeman and stuff, ELP and stuff like that. Right. It was a kind of reaction to that whole kind of progressive rock thing, which was also quite associated with synthesizers. Right, yeah. So I think, so I think that, was, that was part of it. Uh, I think that came more from the musicians and the punks themselves. I think the, the kind of people we kind of came across uh, on tour who bottled us or attempted to bottle us off. Nobody actually managed to do it. Um, <laughs> I think they were just, they, they it's a mixture of, you know, um, con, you know, the, they had an idea of what punk was and that's what it should be. Mm. You know, they were waiting, for, they were waiting for stiff little fingers to come on stage. Right. Uh, I mean, we didn't get it. Didn't happen everywhere. There was, it was just a, there were, you know. Sometimes we had, we we were fairly appreciated, depending on where we were playing. But we had some nasty moments. But, yeah. And you know, fueled with alcohol and you know, probably <laughs> amphetamines and whatever. You know, it's just that we were different. We weren't not a you know we were not punks. And and uh, and I think we were just different. And suicide had the very same problem when they supported the Clash as well. Right. Right. Yeah, I read that in the book as Famously. well. Famously. Is yeah. the is the prevalence of electronic music today and the and the forty years of mute is is the ubiquity of synths and drum machines is that vindicating for you at all? Um, in a way, it is. Yeah, in a way, it's vindicating. I mean, uh, you know, I had a very strong feeling that this was going to be. 
I mean, of course, I didn't invent electronic music. <laughs> you know, there was some great electronic music going on, which influenced me, inspired me a lot. Sure. But I think, I think that, you know, it did kind of live in a slightly, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, kind of lofty, in a kind of lofty place. Even if, I mean, I'm talking about good stuff as well. Yeah. Know? And it wasn't really accessible to people. Mm. And I suppose the generation of electronic musicians that I was part of, you know, you include the Human League, Cabo Voltaire, Robin Gristle, et cetera. Yeah. We were all coming from a very different, I mean, I did I, I don't want to mislead you. I didn't know any of those people, but mm -hmm. you know, but at the time, but um, we were all coming from a very different place, you know, and we, and you know, there was that kind of, um, you know, using cheap fish, cheap tech, relatively cheap technology, you know, home recording, um, not going to big studios um, and the whole DIY thing um, was, was new for sure. Mm, yeah. And, and it, yeah, I, you know, and uh, and I, I, you know, I felt strongly at the time that, you know, I was kind of making a bit of a statement about what it, what how life, you know, how music could be, I suppose, and that it was, it's not just about those kind of elitist groups, and it's actually something you can do in your bedroom, which of course now, well, not just now, last fifteen <laughs> years, it's been possible with you know software, you yeah, know, literally everybody's doing it in their in their in their bedrooms, you know, so. Um, the kind of democratization of it, I, I'm extremely happy about. Well, um, I, yeah. Well, I was so in that in that uh, that story. I, I just picked up your book a, a couple of days ago in preparation for this, and I love it. And I'm I'm not even a, a tenth of the way through it. Um, but I I love the story of how how this iconic electronic music label began. And and you record, you know, talking about this bedroom musician, you recorded these two songs, TVOD and Warm Leatherette, at home. Then you got the artwork made from a friend. And you decided you're going to press 500 copies. What gave you the confidence to do that? And and what would 545s cost someone back then? Well, what gave me the confidence to press for, uh, 500? Yeah, for of your first. Well, I didn't have the confidence to press 500, <laughs> but that's the minimum that the pressing oh. plant would do. <laughs> I see. I, had, no, I didn't. Have, I certainly. I didn't think I'd sell a single one. You know, oh. but if I was going to press, if I was going to press right. the record, that that was the minimum quantity that the pressing plant would. Uh, would do, you know, so that, okay. that was, that was based purely on that decision. <laughs> um, yeah. But it worked out okay. In those days, were there an A sides and a B sides as we know them today? Or, or was there one song that you thought was more dominant? Um, well, there, in general, yeah, there were A sides and B sides, of course, but, um, I kind of made mine a sort of double A, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it feels that yeah. way. Yeah. yeah. The record went on to sell thousands of copies and effectively launched Mute. If Mute was created, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if Mute was created to fictionally release the normal, then then when things took off for the normal, why did Mute continue, but as you as the normal stopped releasing music? Good question. Uh, one I've been asked before. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I never thought of myself particularly as a musician. Or as a or as a recording artist, should we say? Um, I made that single. I didn't think anything would come of it. I thought I'd just go back to my day job. Um, I did it to make because I, I wanted to know if I could do it. It was more like, a, can I make a record? You know? Yeah. And um, and also to make a little bit of a statement, as we said before, about the possible future of music. You know? Right. Um, and I kind of thought I'd done my job in a way, and. Um, Wow. Then when I started working with other musicians, um, I realized that what I really enjoyed was, was, was actually nurturing other musicians. And it took a lot of pressure off me to have to make records as well. But, yeah. um, but I actually enjoyed working with other musicians in the studio and, and, and you know, and planning, helping to sort of plan their careers and stuff like that. And I want to fast forward 20 years or so. And, 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 and in the book that I was reading about you, and I'm excited to get to it in your book, but I want to, I want to talk about the breakthrough of Moby specifically later in his career with play and how that went down. I mean, this was, what was so special about Moby and why did it take until his third record with you guys to break through? Well, I mean, he broke through hugely with play, but he, he had a very good following before that with Everything Is Wrong. Mm -hmm. And obviously, when, you know, he had his singles, which he released uh, called, you know, especially Go, which was a big hit. Right. Um, and then he made a kind of a sidestep with Animal Rights, which is basically a punk rock record, mm -hmm. um, and which didn't really go down very well with his fans or with anybody in particular. <laughs> 
but I think it was an important record for him to make at that point. You know, you know, if he hadn't made that record, he may never have made play. Mm. So, I mean, so play, uh, so he was, he was doing well up to the point of animal rights, you know, mm-hmm. um, he was, you know, and he, if, you know, who knows? It's, it's impossible to say what would have happened next if he'd made a different kind of record at that time. I couldn't possibly say. Yeah. But um, he, 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 he was known. He was well known, you know, and um, uh, because obviously he was DJing a lot as well. And right. as a DJ, he was extremely successful already. Uh, but play took a long time to get going. You know, we, you know, we all here believe really believed in the record, and the people we worked with really believed in it. But it seemed to take a long time to get off the ground. You know, really, mm. Why Does My Heart Feel So Bad was the single that broke through. Right. Um, in, in Europe, anyway. And um, that was the fourth single from the album. It came out, I wow. don't know, eight, eight or nine months, I think. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, after the album was released. And the album was kind of ticking along at a lowish level. Um, I remember very clearly that when the Melody Maker, which is no longer with us, mm. uh, reviewed it, they, they gave it a full page, zero out of ten review. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Which I would think is a great, is great. Yeah, know? that's good publicity, um, I guess. Better than like a like a two inch column, five out of ten. You know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, anyway, but anyway, you know, and and, yeah. and then eventually got picked up on the radio. That track got picked up by Pete Tong on the radio, and he started playing it. And it kind of explained it from that moment. It went very fast, you know, extremely I've, fast. I've heard that Moby was one of the first artists to embrace commercial licensing to film and TV ads. How did that go over with fans and other artists at the time? And how did that decision impact his career? Well, I think it made a lot of difference in exposing the music from, for play. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we weren't getting any airplay. So he, thought, he, he just said, well, if we're, not getting, if we're not getting any airplay, let's find a different way of right. getting to hear it. And, you know, it, it got, it started to get exposure on commercials and it's, it's, you know, the people who pick the music for commercials, they tend to follow the herd. So when one person picks it up, everybody will start, everybody starts picking it up. Right. Know? Right. Um, and so that, that spread quite quickly as well. I mean, uh, and I think a lot of musicians at the time were, you know, disagreed with him. Hmm. Um, I mean, maybe not personally, but you know, just, you know, cause the people up to that point, people were very, um, protective about their music going on commercials um now everybody just wants their music on commercials yeah. <laughs> it's changed completely yeah. as, a, as a label and a public record a music publisher you know yeah oh first for sure thing anybody says is how come my i didn't get that apple ad or i didn't get yeah. that vw ad or, or whatever it is you know, it's that so true powder ad, you know? yeah that's so true um so you know that's changed a lot and I, obviously and you know he i guess he was part of that change as well the change mm. in attitude as well as record sales going down so much, you know, that people had to rely on other sources of income. Well, I can't take any more of your time. And I really, I really do appreciate you taking this call. And uh, as I talked a lot with Amy about, uh, you know, the current state of mute and, um, and getting, reading through your book and through David's book, um, I'm, I'm really just in awe that I, I had a chance to talk to you today. So thank you so much for that time. It's a pleasure. I hope it goes well. I, I just want to ask you, our listeners are owners of record labels and some who are thinking about starting a record label, some who've been running a record label for the past five or 10 years. Do you have any advice for them? Is there something you would have wished you could have told yourself back in, in 1978? Well, that's a bit difficult because I didn't really think I was starting a record label at that point. <laughs> right. I was just putting out a record. Right. That's um, true. I mean, I think the, the thing that you, you know, especially now, uh, well, well, I don't know about especially now, but definitely at any time when you're starting a, an independent record label, you have to have absolute commitment and passion mm. for it. I mean, I, you know, I had a, a job which was a, a, not a bad job before I did it, but I hated it. Right. I didn't want to go back there. <laughs> and I, so when I started, I didn't really have anywhere else to go, you know. Mm. And so I had to do it in a way. And if, I think having to do it as well as having the passion to do it makes a big difference. If you've always... If you always think, well, I could go back and be a doctor or a lawyer or a truck driver or whatever it is that you did before, it's a bit too much of a. I think I like the. I like. I don't like. Uh, I don't like safety nets. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good. That's a good thought. Well, I appreciate yeah, it. But I mean, otherwise, you know, other advice is phew, be good to your artists, pay them on time. Mm. <laughs> um, yes. You know, be honest with them. Yeah. 
you know, well, tons of things. Yeah, and and that's you know what? That's, stuff, yeah. that's something that people early on when working with you, um, when, when, when other bands had opportunities to go elsewhere to major labels, the people worked with you because they saw something, they saw your honesty and uh, your integrity. That, that's something that I've been reading. Well, I mean, we were, I was very fortunate to work with artists who uh, we were able to who we were able to work with for many many years over a long career, and that's that's been a real privilege for me and a pleasure. That's a t- well, not pleasure whole time, but you know, mostly <laughs> a pleasure. <laughs> thank you so much for easy. thank you so much for taking the time to do this, Daniel. I really appreciate it. Okay, you're welcome. Take care, sir. Bye bye. And here's the rest of our mute records episode with Amy Spencer. You know, it's interesting because the history of Mute for, you know, 40 years, and it's, it. I imagine uh, an office place where everyone's just standing around and, and talking about Moby and talking about, um, you know, all these like Nick Cave and all these iconic bands. But the reality is there's still things happening today. Releases are still coming out. There's obviously an excitement for what's happening at Mute in 2019 and in 2018 and 2020. So can you talk a little bit about that, about, you know, uh, what it's like to work at such an iconic label, but still have that responsibility to break new acts and to discover new music? Yeah, I mean, there's a big history. When I started, it was kind of overwhelming. Um, I mean, Daniel is like historical in himself because he, yeah, I mean, he he was like one of the first, he was the first release on mute. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then, but yeah, I guess that there is a, I mean, it's, yeah, it's a lot, it's a tricky question. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess the new art, Daniel's really forward thinking and likes to, I don't know, pick, he doesn't really follow like a trend. He kind of just like likes what he likes. And I think that's kind of, why Mute has managed to sustain itself and be this cool label and stay, I don't know, keep the same image. Mm -hmm. Um, And the artists we're signing now are maybe their current, but also it's just what Daniel likes and what the A&R team really love. And yeah, and artists that we get along with too. And they're all kind of crazy and weird and we love them for that. And it kind of, yeah, it makes mute mute. Is that kind of answering the question? Yeah, no. And I'm, and I'm curious, definitely. And I'm, I'm curious, uh, like, uh, there, there's, um, I'm curious about projects that you're working on right now that, um, that you're excited about or, or something that you've worked on in the past year. Like, um, I, I just think that it, is, is it, uh, are some of the newer artists at risk of, of being overlooked because of, you know, new order and, <laughs> you know what I mean? And yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think that that is definitely something new, not struggled with, but kind of had to, had to, th- has to think about a lot because often when you post something on Instagram, for example, you'll end up, if, if it's a new artist, you might get X amount of releases, um, sorry, not releases, X amount of, um, likes, but when you, um, post something about New Order or Depeche Mode, you're probably going to get at least double that. <laughs> right. So is it, that's a bit frustrating, but I think it's just about finding, constantly finding a new audience as well as keeping old, or older audience or the old audience. And yeah, um, but yeah, new stuff we've been working on. There's, I mean, there's such a big variety. The um, last year we put out. Um, so we put out Chris Carter, for example, who is a member of Throwing Gristle. So okay. quite a legendary artist. And he put out a new new record. So that and that did really well. And it's still the campaign is still kind of going and we released it last March. Wow. So so yeah, the artists like that, it we, we kind of laid the foundation for an old like a legacy artists to then come and release new material and mm-hmm. then we also had daniel bloomberg in may i think releasing a debut record and that did really well and he got rough trade out um number six i think he was in mm-hmm. the album chart wow. and yeah so they're they're kind of different different artists and then this year we have um apparat which is really different to both of those um he is like coming off the back of moderate stuff 
and the record will probably be out before this podcast is okay. released. Okay. Um, but yeah, we kind of just announced that like a couple of weeks ago and we had a great reaction to that. And then, yeah, we've got loads of different stuff coming up and, but we have also got, um, like the catalog reissues as well. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a certain ratio releasing, um, a rarities box set was like 55 tracks on like a seven, um, vinyl box set. So wow. yeah, we're doing, doing all kinds of stuff. Do you like working old... on those on legacy projects like that? Yeah. It's funny with a certain ratio. I didn't really know them before I started. Um, but yeah, it's really been really fun. We have we put out so many vinyl by them and mm-hmm. I think we've done since I started, we must've done over, over 10, reissues and then we did a compilation with them in october i think and then we are doing the box set this year because it's their 40th anniversary oh okay so yeah it's been really nice working with them and they're really fun and yeah and there's like mark stewart and these like really interesting characters and quite different styles really right um so yeah i really like working with them and i love like delving into the history of them but it's also great working with new artists and see seeing how they can develop and right. kind of marketing those records as well. Yeah, and I I think that's probably a good diversity to have um, that keeps you probably entertained. It just can, kind of keeps you exciting, <laughs> you yeah, know, like the definitely. that uh, th- that good ana- it's a good analogy about like Instagram and and how you know, it's so rewarding probably to, to release a reissue because you have so many fans from so many decades that, that will all be excited about it. But, um, to that feeling of breaking a new artist, uh, is probably even more so rewarding. Yeah, definitely. So what's your role at at Mute? I want to ask about you a little bit. So I am assisting basically everyone there. Okay. (laughs) Um, We're quite, we're quite a small team. So, Oh, really? In the record label, we are seven, um, and that's including wow. Daniel. That's yeah. including Daniel. Oh, my goodness. We, that's incredible. We, I th- yeah, I think the label is downsized and kind of... I was picturing got- like two floors of an office of like <laughs> 200 people. Yeah. Um, wow. Maybe it once was. We have um, <laughs> we work like this as the label, but we have a lot of people kind of helping Right. On the okay. outside as well. So okay. we have we have PS who we work with closely for marketing and distributing the record, and then we have a radio team and we have press. So yeah, there's there's a big there's a big team around us, and then we have the publishing downstairs mute song. Mm. So yeah, um, but there's so there's seven of us, and I assist uh, marketing, art and production, and A and R, and then I do bits of digital stuff. And then I kind of do even the stuff like posting things and right. I don't know, mail outs, things like that. Yeah. So yeah, pretty much everything. I've learned a hell of a lot this year. Um, what, what do you like yeah. to work on? What kind, like what is the responsibility around a release that is, is most um, energizing to you? Um, I definitely enjoy like the marketing and planning at like the campaign. Mm. I guess I've never done it myself, but it's been great to kind of oversee these and, and have input on, I don't know, these decisions. And I don't know where you think it might be good for an artist to play their live show in London or mm. this kind of stuff, slightly more creative things. Um, and then, I mean, I'm doing all the very annoying admin stuff too, like setting metadata off, but I mean, it's still <laughs> nice to just right. be involved in the, the whole process. And, yeah. yeah. And, and see, just seeing an artist develop has been really nice so yeah and how many how many different branches sorry i'm going off in all directions here no, but no. Uh, how many different branches to the label you said that there's publishing um i see on your website there's like a recording studio with like a bunch of vintage gear and yeah. <laughs> and then you have um which is really cool and then you we're talking also about another label like a kind of like a, a sister label or a daughter label or something but how many different like entities are surround that that kind of the mute brand so yeah so we have mute song the publisher and they have lots and lots of artists some okay. cross over mm-hmm. to mute and some don't oh okay um but a lot do um so yeah there's like five of them down there <laughs> and then <laughs> we cross over a lot um and then we have a studio downstairs um and 
artists can kind of come in and use it. We have the in-house engineer wow. who is there quite a lot, but she's mainly doing, she kind of uses the studio for her own stuff, but whenever we kind of need something, she's called Francine <laughs> and she'll be used um, for various like, edits and mixes and stuff like that. That's really so, handy to have. Yeah. Um, the person who used to be there was called Marta Salogni and she is doing really well. And yeah, I'm, she is like a really inspiring mixing engineer now who's kind of moved on to be in a studio with David Wrench. So mm. yeah. And yeah, it's definitely um, a really nice place to work and there's lots and lots of gear. Um, most of it is Daniel's. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I um, bet. I bet. I don't, yeah. He uses it sometimes. He's not, not in the office so much. Right. But, yeah. And is that like handy for like, do you guys master your records down there or like work on reissues and stuff like that? Yeah, a lot of, not really mastering. We use um, different mastering houses, okay. but we, Francine will mix um, quite a few of the records down there or people um, might come to do like bits of mixing, but it, it really varies to be honest. Mm. We, we I guess me, it's kind of quite old school in the sense that it still uses like, I mean, we use like Abbey Road for mixing and mastering and <laughs> stuff like that. Um, I'm not sure other labels use that yeah. anymore. <laughs> no. So yeah, I've never used Abbey Road for mixing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Fair enough>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just regular people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, how close is Abbey Road to you? Not. Yeah, pretty close. Not, oh, not too far. That's Closer than cool. it is to you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. And I think that's, I mean, that's actually the, the idea of a studio. I find it fascinating because it is kind of a little bit more um, traditional um, for like old, you know, older, older record labels. So it's the whole idea of recording music and then releasing it yourself. So I think not that, you know, budget is a huge thing issue for you guys maybe but it probably saves a bit of money to be able to do mixed revisions and for artists to be able to use it as opposed to having to shell out money to go somewhere else so it's probably a great resource yeah it really is i think that was that's always the incentive and if you um look back on mute's history they used to be in a place called harrow road which is pretty close to our office now which is a much bigger office with a big studio. Hmm. And I think that used to have a live room, so they would actually record records in there. I oh, think. wow. Um, and then when we moved to Hammersmith, they did have a slightly bigger studio, but now it's kind of downsized. But it's still pretty decent. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say you can record a band in there, but you can definitely do like some, I don't know, extra bits on the record. And, right. and you could you can you can do stuff there. It depends on this on the the genre, I guess, sure, yeah. what you're trying to do. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's great. That's really cool. And so what other, okay, so you have publishing, you have studio. Um, what yeah, other kind of branches? A, we have, the only other thing really is we have a sub-label called Novamute, which is um, kind of a label that kind of used to be around. I'm not entirely sure when that started, but it kind of phased out and then, We've now relaunched it. I think it relaunched in 2017. Oh, okay. Um, so we just put out 12 inches, usually like an EP of mostly techno. Oh, um, I see. Okay. So, so genre specific? Different. Yeah. It's pretty much, I mean, it's a very specific sound, sounding techno, basically. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And Daniel is quite heavily in, influenced by that kind of music. Right. So that's an area he wants to wanted to revisit. Um, and yeah, so there's artists like Nicholas Bugayev, who's a new artist, and Terence Fixma, who has been around for a while, and then up and coming artists like Anna and Charlotte DeWitte. So yeah, mm. some really nice stuff. And then there's some new releases coming this year. Um, but yeah, they basically we put them out on 12 inch vinyl, quite a limited edition. Brand. Oh, cool. And then, yeah. And then they go up digitally after, after they've kind of sold out. I actually so, think yeah. I, I was talking to someone about something similar to this and I can't remember now, but I think it might be ghostly who has like a similar sub label at, that oh, nice. does the same thing, just kind of limited edition vinyl. I think it was ghostly. Anyway, yeah, I think it works well for this kind of, this definitely. Style of music. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. And what, what, um, how do you decide where a, an artist goes to, to Nova or to, you know, the parent label? I think because Nova Mute is so specific in genre, I think it would, 
Yeah, I mean, it's actually funny because we released a record by Chris Liebing, who's a big techno DJ, big, quite big in Europe. And mm-hmm. he has known Daniel for a while, but he's never actually released on Overmute. He's always, um, yeah, he, he's always wanted, I think he always wanted to be, to release on Mute, but he actually wrote a record that was much more fitting to Mute. And I don't know, it, it had much more of a, and a slower sound and hmm. it's still electronic but it, it definitely wouldn't have fit on overmute so that's kind of interesting oh cool but okay. i mean he could definitely play at an overmute show right um yeah so that's 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 but yeah most most artists would go to mute it's very specific to be honest i don't know if um no, it would ever branch out further than, than the techno. Music. Right, right. Oh, I think uh, a genre specific label, especially like a small sub label or or boutique label. I think that's such a cool thing. As a music yeah. fan, I I like yeah. that a lot. Yeah, I really like it. And is yeah, it the really same like... team? Is it you guys? You seven? Exact, exactly. Yeah. And sometimes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we're doing that's quite funny. a lot. Yeah, that's I think funny. um Paul A. Taylor, who works in art and production is is struggling sometimes to get right. all the art <laughs> yeah. to all the art because it's, it's crazy to be honest and and every, everyone is doing a lot but um yeah i'd kind of like to spend a bit more time focusing on no mute because i think it's something we sometimes forget how we have so much to do with mute and then you you don't want to let like forget about that part of the of the company as well right yeah no um, i imagine but yeah, some exciting stuff coming. We're just trying to grow that label, and and potentially it will it will keep growing, and we'll need more people. But for now, it's just it's, it's there's not enough releases to make it. Um, yeah, to yeah. have more people doing. No, that's so, yeah. fair. Uh, how did you, let's go back to you? How did you come to be at mute? What's your story? <laughs> it's such a cliche. I am. <laughs> uh, I studied music at Goldsmiths in London, and then was doing my own music quite a lot, but it kind of found that I wasn't really getting anywhere with it. So mm-hmm. I wanted just to meet people in music and I really liked working in, I, I kind of liked the idea of working in the music industry as well as kind of performing in it. Um, Why? So, and I, what, what was that? Well, well, I used to do just like a part-time job um, as a nanny, which wasn't particularly <laughs> exciting whilst trying to be a musician. Right. I think I found it wasn't that inspiring and, even though I had a bunch of musician friends, I f- thought that maybe meeting new people on the other side of the industry mm. would kind of benefit me. Um, but actually it turned into be something that I really love doing and, I, and I'm still doing music, but I think I actually do more now I'm surrounded by so many like inspiring people mm. and artists and yeah. And just listening to so much music all the time. Yeah. So yeah, I, so I basically got a job in, um, the reception at PS, which is the distributor okay. that we work with. Um, and that's where I met Mute because Mute come in for meetings every every two weeks oh, or so. Oh, wow. So, yeah, okay. We and then they had this job going and that's that's it really. So I haven't I haven't been in the music industry for such a long time on on this side of things anyway. But um I've been involved with music for quite a long time so yeah that's, that's a, the story that's and it's it's interesting you said it's cliche and it is but it's it's funny because <laughs> i've heard that story a lot and it and yeah. and i think like in the, if you think about you know in the movies like if somebody wants to work like a record label they start in the mail room and and it's like that's like a, a cliche joke but i've actually heard it work a few times now it kind of makes me think like mm-hmm. if i'm like if i ever come back in into another life as like a 15 year old 16 year old i'm gonna go work at a record label in the mail room because it does work (laughs) definitely does it's just so competitive and if you even if you have the experience to do i don't know to be a project manager but you you don't actually i mean you don't you haven't worked in the music industry you just you just have i don't know i know you're bright enough to do it but you haven't had that experience of being in the music industry then you're not going to get the job you need to kind of start at the bottom Mm. in most cases and just kind of absorb the music and i mean i i learned i I got so many records when i was at ps and Mm. that was a really good foundation and then yeah it it just yeah it's just competitive and that's the way it is but yeah i recommend working in the the mail room and and the other thing i like what you said too is like and i totally i totally get where you're coming from is if for for musicians i'm a musician too and i think Mm -hmm. for anyone who's um, struggling to, you know, 
um, ha- make a full time income out of music, which is like ninety nine percent of musicians, um, you don't want to have to step out of that world and go and work on a farm or work in a coffee yeah. shop or nanny. I think that there's uh, to be able to stay in that zone, even if it's supporting other artists by working PR or marketing or something. I totally agree with that. I, yeah. I love that. Yeah, it's definitely helped me. And yeah, just every day when I'm, I don't know, listening to new music, that will inspire me. Or I don't know. Yeah, it, it's been great. Definitely, it was a good move for me. Um, and, yeah. and and what is it about it that that made you want to stay doing it? Because, you know, you were doing it as, as a way to kind of help offset the, the your income as a musician. But what what was the tipping point for you to say this is, I'm going to take this more seriously. And I, and I like being on the business side of things. Oh, it's tricky. I mean, it still hasn't been so long, but I think that I'm, I think I'm just good at doing this kind of organizational role within music. And I think that I'll always be able to do both and I'll never have to choose. I think that kind of made me realize actually I can do both and I don't need to worry about doing just like right. a coffee shop job. I think, right. I think it's, it's fine if you're organized and you can kind of manage your time and you can, you can definitely do it. Hmm. I mean, I, I, I'm not doing, I mean, maybe if I was running a record label, that would be a different story. Right. Right. But right, right now it, it's working. So yeah, that's, that was kind of my, that reassures me, I think. So you're a, a musician. What kind of music did you do you play? Um, so I've been in several bands, but varied from like a, a lot of like electronic, um, top lining stuff. Okay. To and that more like piano, um, guitar, vocal kind okay. of stuff. I, it's really hard. To sure, describe. I get that. You know, you is know this, what it's like. Yeah. <laughs> is it? Is it? Um, is this like your secret long game of, of getting signed by mute is just to start? <laughs> are you going to try to sign yourself one day? You are, aren't you? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. I don't think it works like that. <laughs> I think, I don't think, um, yeah, Daniel doesn't work that way. I mean, who knows, but I don't, there's def- <laughs> definitely not, that definitely wasn't the goal. Um, but it's, it, it's definitely helped me to become a better musician being here. So really, that, that's yeah, definitely. How has that helped um, your like? How has that made you wiser? Uh, and and what what kind of advice would you give for like artists, you know, up and coming who are looking to get signed, maybe or or trying to run their own career? Yeah, um, I think I think getting your record deal is a good thing. I think being surrounded for me being surrounded by the label has only helped me um and I've kind of seen that I think at first when I don't know when you're younger maybe you think you can self-release and in today's world you you can actually self-release anything but it doesn't really work that well in in my opinion because Mm. everything just gets lost Mm -hmm. unless you have you really you really do need the platform of a label or you or you need a lot of money and it's really tough but I think I think you can I think it, I think you can get signed if you're good enough you will mm. you just need to keep pushing it I mean I know it's easier said than done but I think you just need to either be in the right place at the right time <laughs> or you need to keep pushing and pushing and um, but I, I definitely think from working in labels I don't think they're always as bad as they can be portrayed to the artist right um, I, spe- I think probably because I've worked at Mute which is such an artist led label. Mm. Um, literally what? the artists will make, I mean, most of the decisions, which is really? quite crazy compared to, yeah. Like, what does that mean? Artist led, like what kind of decisions would they make? Well, they will have pretty much all control of their aesthetic. Hmm. They will, I mean, they'll work closely with the A&R on the, on the audio, but they will pretty much be able to present their album to us and we will put it out because ultimately we signed them. So we made that deal with them wow. and we're going to support them. And I mean, some stuff on mute, because most, if you look at mute, a lot of artists have stayed with mute over the, over the years and they haven't left hmm. um, because they build a relationship with us because we are artist led and we allow the artists to just be themselves and we don't make them make decisions they hmm. didn't want to make. Right. Uh, I, th- I think that's, that's what Daniel always tried to do. 
and it, and it and it does work and it's and maybe it sometimes doesn't work because i guess when you have an artist in in a record label and they're saying to you i don't want to do i don't want to put my single out this day but actually if you don't put it out then then i mean you know it, it's just sometimes it can maybe go wrong because they they shouldn't always make the decision when they mm. haven't spent 20 years like working in marketing right but at the right. same time if they don't want to then we're not going to do that because so yeah it's, it's about balance that's really cool yeah but usually it works i think yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> well that's so smart i mean it's so obvious that you signed the band so why wouldn't you let them make artistic decisions yeah that's really it's interesting basically, it's about them being the artist and us being the label and we can facilitate their like artistic needs and yeah I think it's really nice. That's great. And I, I had read that about you guys and I was kind of curious as to, as to what that kind of means. Mm. Um, can you talk about the 40th anniversary? Cause 1978 is, is the year, right? That it, that, that Daniel formed yeah. it. What, um, ha, have you celebrated the 40th or are you in the midst of that or what went down yeah. with that? A lot to say. <laughs> 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 yeah. So the fourth, well, for, for start Daniel and, Everyone at Mute decided that we don't want to call it a 40th anniversary. Okay. Sorry. Um, so, no, no, no. <laughs> Just letting you know. <laughs> so, it's we, we called it um, Mute 4.0 and the tagline is 1978 until tomorrow. So, it's kind oh, of, wow. rather than looking back and kind of reflecting on what we have done, it's kind of thinking, oh, well, this is the next chapter. Let's keep looking forward. Mm-hmm. Which is which is really nice. Um, so yeah, the, one of the first, one of the main main events we did was at Rough Trade East in October, and that was with. Um, so we had Chris Carter, Lost Under Heaven, and a certain ratio playing, and then we had DJ sets from Mac, Maps and mm. sound like kind of soundscape things okay. from Simon Fisher Turner, and it was. I don't know if anyone realised at the time, but I kind of looked back and thought that this was actually nice because all these artists are relatively new to me, or at least they put out records last year. We're going to put records out. Mm. And that's kind of nice that we didn't invite lots of older artists yeah. to, to play. It was yeah. really cool. I thought, so basically we had lots of like old mute fans coming down, but some new people coming and everyone wore mute t-shirts. And we've been doing a reissue campaign. Um, we started uh, in October last year. And we had all of those like up on the wall. So we uh, put out Apparat, Josh D. Pearson, and then Silicon Teens, which is Daniel's, one of Daniel's projects from the 80s, I think. Oh, early, okay. Late, late 70s. And Fad Gadget, VCMG. So yeah, there's been, there's been a lot of stuff going on. Um, and then we've also been doing uh, this thing called Pitch Black Playback, which is where you listen to an album in the dark. I don't know if you've heard of that. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, so we're doing like a series of them. So the first one was Yazoo, Upstairs at Eric's. And then I think last month was Moby's Play. Oh, and then wow. I think next month or the end of this month is going to be Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, Murder Ballads. Oh, wow. Um, so you basically just sit there and they give you a blindfold and you listen to the entire record. That's really cool. Is, yeah, quite amazing. It's like those um, uh, I, restaurants for in the dark, you know? Oh, really? Uh, I, think, I think that's the thing. I don't know. I saw it on TV. <laughs> you, like, I have to meal. tell Mute about that. That's our next. That's to be the 50th. <laughs> yeah, 50th. <laughs> that's a great idea. Um, have you done that? Yeah. Have you been to one of them? Like, No, I need. To, we need to go to one. Uh, I don't know why. It's been. There's been so much going on. Um, right. But yeah, maybe we'll go to the Nick Cave one. But yeah, it sounds amazing. I, so, yeah. I uh, just listened to... Um, after I was reading this book about uh, that was talking about mute and Moby, I mm-hmm. I put on play again, and um and I don't think I had to be honest with you I don't think I had listened to it since high school when I did listen mm-hmm. to it a ton in high school, and yeah. um and it's just interesting to like go back to some of these records that you that for me as a kid it was just about you know radio music pop music and music you heard on TV commercials. But to actually sit back and listen to play as a artistic record, I was like, man, this is a beautiful record. Like this could come out today and people would think it's amazing. That's so true. Yeah. I love that. I I, I love that record. Um, Mm -hmm. 
I forgot to um, mention that we the kind of biggest part of 4.0 and probably the strangest part <laughs> is that um, we're putting out a compilation record basically with all artists that wanted to be involved who have ever been on mute. Um, so basically we decided that we were, it was the idea of Simon Fisher Turner, who's an artist on mute, mm -hmm. um, to basically get all the artists to interpret John Cage's 433 silence piece. Oh, okay. <laughs> so basically all the artists have sent us four minutes, 33 of silence. <laughs> and is their interpretation of silence? So right. Not all of them are actually, yeah. none of them are really silent. Yeah. And oh, yeah, we, man. we put, so there's like nearly 60 tracks worth of <laughs> silence. <laughs> That's and amazing. Yeah, doing, yeah. And we're doing that for charity and, which is the British Tintus Association and Help Musicians UK. And yeah, it's Amazing. kind of, to, it's to honor this, um, a, a member of In Spiral Carpets called Craig Gill, who suffered from like anxiety and depression as mm. a result of his tinnitus. So it was kind of like a nice way to, I don't know, honor him, but also to honor Mute in the most ridiculous way we could, basically. Right. And <laughs> so, yeah. that's amazing. And who, who contributed to that? So um, every, pretty much everyone, I mean, there's still a few that didn't, but yeah, even Depeche Mode on there, Goldfrapp, wow. Wow. Erasure, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, it's amazing that there's literally the, the newest newest artists on there as well as the eldest. Um, You're right. Yeah, I mean, so many. But yeah, th this is announced. So um, yeah, there's, it, and it went down really well. People, Kind of people reacting in all kinds of ways, as you mm -hmm. can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. I'm going to keep an yeah. eye out for that. That's, that yeah. is really cool. Um, you know, when I was, when I was, uh, something that came up on, um, this was a, a couple of weeks ago, um, your book came up on my feed and I think mm. it was from like a, I think it was actually from like a design blog or something, but it was like kind of promoting that. But you, you guys, is that, is that like book of, of artwork and everything? The big orange book, is that part of the 4.0 campaign? I have it in front of me. Um, oh. No, it was, um, <laughs> it, it was, I think it was out just before. So it came out at the end of 2017. Um, and it, I mean, I guess maybe it was part of the incentive, but cause it, the title has 1978 to tomorrow as well. Right. Um, but yeah, it's basically a, a, like it says, a visual document of me over the years. Um, Is that something you guys a, put out? Yeah, so okay. Paul A. Taylor, who does, we, Faber put it out, they published it, wow. um, but Paul A. Taylor and Daniel Miller put it together, and also along with Terry Burroughs, who is the author, and yeah, it's amazing. I have to get a copy it's, of that. It's yeah. really beautiful. Finally. Yeah, it's, it's mostly just artwork and photographs, mm -hmm. um, but it, ha it has some, I mean, it has key information, it, it's really beautiful. You yeah. know, I, I'm trying to think of where I first saw that because it wasn't, um, it was actually before we were talking and it was probably one of the reasons that I, I thought to email you, but, um, I can't for the life of remember, it must've been in a bookstore or something, but it was, I think yeah. it was in cellophane. So I couldn't look, <laughs> look at it, but, <laughs> yeah. um, but anyway, it, that is really cool. I love whenever, and I mean, you guys have a synthesizer as well, like, uh, like <laughs> in your, in your store, but like, I think that is so cool when when labels kind of go beyond into the physical world a little bit mm -hmm. yeah we definitely like a, we, we've mentioned a bit before but i think it's been always quite important to keep an aesthetic as well as i mean mm -hmm. just thinking about the music i think keeping the image it's happened quite naturally i think but making sure that the image is kind of there and stayed the same and i think it kind of shows in the art in the, in the book of art really how like the image has been pretty constant throughout. Um, yeah. That's amazing. What um, I'm curious, kind of going back to you a little bit in, in um, a, a label, there's seven people, but um, in my mind, I'm still picturing 200 people in this big <laughs> corporate office, but whatever, I'll trust you. Um, so do you, do you feel that your perspective as, as a young person is valued at the label at, at a 40 year old label? Yeah, I think so. And that's quite an interesting question. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, it is really valued. And I think in, in this time, it, 
I think things are changing so much with music and with, with things like streaming and stuff, but it was asked about this kind of thing and the way we absorb music and um, I don't know what kind of music we're listening to because it's difficult because the A&Rs uh, mute have been there for a long time as well. So mm. it's just trying to, and, and because we're trying to stay, um, I kind of keep mute as genuine and authentic as we can at the same time, we're still trying to survive as a label. So right. it's just kind of understanding what I don't know young people want now, as well as like, slightly older people and the fans of mute for years want so it's kind of just getting that balance really so yeah mm. they de we definitely are valued and because we're such a small team everyone kind of feels on the same level it doesn't feel like it feels like we we definitely do have our own say and our own voice so yeah that's, that's amazing really nice. yeah i mean daniel's always asking asking what we think about stuff which is amazing well and it's so, so yeah. i think it's valuable because i think the way that you can consume music is probably different or the way that your peers consume music is different than how daniel would consume music oh yeah definitely um i, I wonder i mean daniel's djing a lot right yeah <laughs> so he probably he's probably, tons he's of probably pretty <laughs> hip <laughs> yeah, he is <laughs> <That's true. laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I, I, there, you touched on something, and I want to. I want to ask you. Like, is um, is it challenging or is it a blessing that your audience, um, some of your audience may have been there from the very beginning, and some of your audience may be quite young high schoolers and are discovering your music. Is that a challenge um, to have such a diverse audience, or is that a good thing? Yeah, I think we're still quite stuck with on. Um, hardcore mute fans from years ago, which is great, <laughs> yeah, which is amazing, sure. and, and not and maybe not many labels have that. So it's right. that's really cool. We just still, like I said earlier, just trying to figure out sometimes how to put out and market the new the newer stuff to these people because the sound maybe has changed slightly in new signings and is always changing. Um, it's not like we're putting, we've put out like a hundred Depeche modes or, <laughs> or I don't know, lots of, it, yeah, it's yeah. changing a lot. So yeah. yeah. But I think, uh, yeah, I think that it's been, it's really good to have this kind of, I, I don't know, divided group of fans mm -hmm. rather than just lots of young people. I think it's, it's really nice and rare. So yeah, yeah it, it's just, it's just, it's definitely a challenge, but I think it, it can work in our favor. We just, need to figure out in terms of streaming and things like that, how to, yeah, how to balance that and push that more. But we, in terms of like physical sales, that would definitely work in our favor. So right, that's it's kind true. of, so yeah, yeah it, it's, it's kind of a complicated one, but yeah. What's your outlook on the, on the music industry? I mean, you're coming into it now and, and, and uh, how, how do you think, do you think it's in, in good shape? Do you think there's uh, areas that need to improve? Yeah, so that's such a tricky one. Um, there's definitely, yeah, there's definitely like a big push towards streaming, which can be like a really good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's definitely working for the really big artists, which I guess, yeah, mate on the majors really. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a struggle for for some artists on you, I guess, because we have a lot of niche stuff, right? Um, right. Which we we love, but I, I think it's important to work closely with our artists and just see how we can like utilize streaming platforms and I don't know, this kind of new way of um, absorbing music and like listening to music, mm -hmm. but like also make sure we don't get like too bogged down in like these algorithms <laughs> and I like, kind of instead just like tailor, yeah, tailor the release to the artist really. And like tailor like each campaign um, and kind of, cause we, we can definitely get too bogged down in just, I don't know, Spotify playlists. Right, and, right. Yeah. I guess it's just tricky because we need to figure out how we can make generate money for the artists and for us and but at the same time not um kind of change the artist the music the artist is making anyway we just want we want to yeah so it it would be great if we if the music industry could kind of keep pushing the like physical sales because mm. and then and hopefully vinyl and things are still making a comeback and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that that's the plan but yeah it's it's tricky i yeah and i think that i mean you look at streaming and vinyl they're on completely ends of the spectrum and mm -hmm. but i hope they can complement each other because i know for for my lifestyle they 
they both serve a really important purpose and the, the yeah. convenience and portability of streaming and then the intimacy of, of physical, you know, cassettes and, and vinyl. Um, and I, I, you know, even just the, the merch section on Spotify, if that can be a little mm -hmm. bit more elaborate and a little bit more user-friendly. Exactly. Um, yeah, I think that could be a really cool balance. Yeah, hopefully the streaming platforms will realize that they can work with labels in that way and, I don't know, yeah, make the merch bar on Spotify even, like you say, a bigger thing and, I don't know, yeah, push the live side on Spotify as well. Kind of making everything linked together would be, and work together mm -hmm. even better would mm -hmm. be, would, I think it would benefit everyone. For sure. Um, but yeah, that is, is tricky with the physical side. Um, and it's funny because, uh, I mean, I'm surrounded by people who buy vinyl and CD, well, CD a bit less, but still they buy physical um, music all the time. But I don't know whether that's just my bubble and whether actually, yeah, right. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that m most of the country isn't buying vinyl and they're just streaming and they pay yeah, 10 pounds a that's month fair. To, to listen to music instead of, 20 pound per record. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, we, uh, I, one of the questions I, I, I did an interview just recently with Taylor Dupree of 12K Records. And I mean, 12K is kind of similar to mute. They, they're a lot of experimental and instrumental stuff. I'm curious mm -hmm. about that genre and, and streaming. And I asked Taylor about this and I want to ask you about this. I'd like, I, in my opinion, I think that streaming really complements electronic music and, and uh, ambient music because um, I, I just feel like it's something that you can really dive into. And a lot of these artists are quite prolific and have big discographies and there's labels like, um, like you guys or Erase Tapes that have such a deep catalog of similar artists that I found mm -hmm. that I've really gotten into ambient and electronic music because of the smorgasbord of, of iTunes and, or of Apple Music and, and Spotify. Do you, do you find That's that at all? I can see what you mean, like kind of jumping from artist to artist mm -hmm. on that kind of platform. Yeah. For me, I, I agree with you. It's introduced me to lots of different artists and through like the release radar and all the different playlists with the algorithms. Mm -hmm. it, it definitely it can like introduce you to a bunch of new artists. Um, and it's really good for artists... Um, who can fit into those more ambient playlists. Yeah. Like we, we have like Jan Tiersen, um coming out tomorrow and that's like um, very beautiful piano focused music mm. and it fits into a ton of playlists on Spotify. And so this kind of music can really work because it, it fits into like relax podcast or uh, sorry, not podcast, yeah. um, playlist. Playlist, or, yeah. Like I don't know. study yeah. and, and sleep exactly. and yoga. Yeah. Yeah, um, but then we also have, I don't know, artists who've written tracks which are like 10 minutes long and it's like, I don't know, so noisy and that, that doesn't fit into a playlist. So <laughs> right. it's just figuring out, right. yeah, but I mean, it's great, but it doesn't necessarily work on, on a streaming platform. And, it, and if it's it, a lot of tracks, if they're, if they're more than, I don't know, four minutes, then they're not going to even get onto the playlist. So oh, yeah, there, there's, some, there's some challenges that we just need to, we need to work with, but we, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, um, but mm -hmm. what's, what's coming out now? Like what, what are we looking at uh, the spring of 2019 or the summer or the fall? Like what, what are some projects and releases you're excited about? So I've, I think I've touched on a few, but um, one artist who's really exciting is Kareen and she is an artist. that's not been around for, for too long, but should we signed her in autumn and okay. she is releasing a f her first record. It's a comp it's sort of like a, she's put out four EPs. So it's a mixture of the four EPs plus a couple new tracks. Um, and yeah, it's beautiful. It's kind mm. of electronic with amazing vocal um, and a really unique sound, I think. Cool. Um, so yeah, there's that. And that comes uh, I guess out kind of the end of March? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, and the week before that, we have Apparat, which is also in the same kind of vein. And their um, Apparat has been around for longer and um, is playing some amazing shows. He's playing the Barbican in uh, end of April with Karina as a support. So oh, cool. it's really nice that some of the artists can kind of team up like that. Yeah. And then and then we have uh, Jan Tiersen coming out tomorrow, which is is going to be amazing. And it's it sounds I don't know like. It sounds 
is, is obviously very authentic, but it has like, elements of Anastigoros, but it also has you know, the old Yantius and sound of the just classic piano. Um, but yeah, so that's... I'll have to check that out. That's, and sorry, Jan Tiersen, that's Y-A-N-N space T-I-E-R-S-E-N. Is that right? Exactly, okay. yeah. Cool, that's, cool, cool. He's amazing. Um, he, li- he lives on an island off of France in, in Brittany, and uh, it's called Wesson. And yeah, it, basically 400 people live there, and he has oh, a wow. studio there and a venue that he's built. Oh, he's man. like... Yeah, if you can delve into Jan, he's I will. a very unique artist. I'm person. going to yeah. as soon as we hang up here. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, and then there's Ma- there's Maps, which is an artist who's releasing his fourth record on Mute. And that's um, with this uh, collective called the Echo Collective. And, hmm. and they're kind of like a ensemble of, um, yeah, strings. And they, yeah, that, that sounds amazing. He's like a, he used to be kind of like a bedroom producer. And now it's kind of, opened up to this new world of wow. I don't know with lots more instruments it's such an amazing record of such beautiful songs so yeah there's so much stuff coming out and a lot of new stuff as well as I'm sure we're going to be doing a bunch of reissues this year um you've already got a bunch scheduled so yeah that's great keep an eye out <laughs> well thanks so much for doing this this has been a lot of fun and it's such an honor yeah. to talk to you and to talk to the label I, I really appreciate it yeah thanks so much And thank you for listening. I want to give a huge shout out to Amy Spencer of Mute. First of all, for responding to my original email and agreeing to do the podcast a few months ago. And second of all, for working so hard to get us that opportunity to talk with Daniel Miller, which was such a cool experience. And so thanks to Amy for doing the show and for facilitating so much um, to make the episode happen. Thank you for listening and please subscribe if you haven't already and check out Mute by going to Mute.com and deep diving into their catalog, new and old.